My name is Mitchell Hepburn. I've been following the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza closely for the past 120 days. I would like to discuss the dynamics at play, particularly around the struggle to get a ceasefire resolution passed at the UN Security Council and the USA's enabling of war crimes through their veto power that the International Court of Justice deemed plausible amount to ethnic cleansing or genocide. There's a component of international law called the responsibility to protect. It's a mechanism of the UN meant to mobilize nations through the Security Council to act to protect nations from crimes against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, genocide. On October 16, I reached out to the office of the UN Secretary General with an urgent warning from one of the UN's special rapporteurs. She warned that the Palestinians were in grave danger of ethnic cleansing and urged the international community to mediate a ceasefire, stating time was of the essence. I paired her warning with a call to invoke the responsibility to protect. The Secretary General was receptive to my message and responsibility to protect, R2P, was invoked automatically before the first Security Council meeting was held on the situation in Gaza. Attached image. However, things didn't go as planned. The USA has for the past 120 plus days been stalling for time and vetoing any resolutions mentioning a ceasefire, whilst providing diplomatic cover for Israel at the UN and privately sending them weapons to carry out their campaign of slaughter in Gaza. Right from the beginning the USA has been reluctant to de-escalate the situation. This Huffington Post headline from October 13 reads, Stunning State Department memo warns diplomats, No Gaza, de-escalation talk. As Israel escalates its offensive, U.S. diplomats are being discouraged from publicly using three phrases that would urge calm. In messages circulated on Friday, State Department staff wrote that high-level officials do not want press materials to include three specific phrases, de-escalation slash ceasefire, end to violence slash bloodshed and restoring calm. Then after weeks of delay, they resisted a full cessation of hostilities on humanitarian grounds, instead opting for a humanitarian pause which Axios reports was intended to buy Israel time for their ground operation, Blinken tells Israelis humanitarian pause will buy Israel time for Gaza operation. The article from November 3rd reads, Secretary of State Tony Blinken told his Israeli counterparts on Friday that agreeing to a humanitarian pause will help the U.S. fend off growing pressure it is facing over its support of Israel's operation in Gaza and in turn help Israel buy more time for its ground offensive, according to one U.S. and three Israeli officials with direct knowledge of the talks. Why it matters, the Biden administration says it supports Israel's goal of dismantling Hamas military capabilities, but it is increasingly under pressure from some Democrats in Congress and its allies and partners in Arab countries to push for a ceasefire in Gaza. Blinken told his Israeli counterparts that the Biden administration is taking a lot of fire domestically and internationally because it is giving Israel its full backing, the Israeli officials said. Behind the scenes, Blinken told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the members of Israel's war cabinet that he understands Israel's operation against Hamas will last longer than a few days. But because of the pressure the U.S. is facing, a humanitarian pause will help Israel buy more time for its ground operation, the U.S. and Israeli officials said. Blinken's message, according to one U.S. and two Israeli officials, was, we don't want to stop you, but help us help you get more time. Israeli leaders, including Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant, IDF Chief of Staff Herzi Halavai and Netanyahu, told Blinken a pause wouldn't happen unless the hostages were released, the Israeli officials said. On December 8, the USA vetoed a resolution on Gaza, which called for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. In spite of the Secretary General's invocation of a rarely used diplomatic tool, Article 99. In the Secretary General's Article 99 invocation, he warned that public order would soon break down in Gaza, rendering it impossible to scale up aid in line with Resolution 2712, and that the only way to fulfill the obligations under Resolution 2712 to scale up aid was with a humanitarian ceasefire. The USA vetoed in spite of this warning. And now again in February, the USA has vetoed the Algerian draft resolution at the Security Council for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire at the UN. The Algerian proposal for a vote on a new resolution came amid growing fears that Israel is planning a ground invasion of Rafah in southern Gaza, 
home to around 1.4 million Palestinians displaced from other parts of the territory since October. Aid agencies and the UN have warned that a ground assault on Rafah could be catastrophic. The US wants to pursue another humanitarian pause instead without explicitly enforcing a permanent end to hostilities. Remember last time Secretary Blinken said behind the scenes, because of the pressure the US is facing, a humanitarian pause will help Israel buy more time for its ground operation, we don't want to stop you, but help us help you get more time. US complicity in this humanitarian catastrophe cannot be denied. They have stalled for time. They have vetoed resolutions that could meaningfully address the situation. And they are actively giving weapons to Israel. This headline from February 17 reads, U.S. to send weapons to Israel amid invasion threat in Gaza's Rafah. Planned delivery of bombs and other munitions comes as President Biden pushes for another temporary truce in Israel's war on Gaza. The administration of U.S. President Joe Biden has so far twice bypassed Congress to urgently send bombs and other munitions to Israel amid the war that has killed more than 28,000 Palestinians, mostly children and women, and left tens of thousands more injured or missing. But why is the Biden administration doing this? What dynamics are at play within Washington, causing such disastrous decision-making? To sum it up, political corruption. And this corruption isn't specific to the Biden administration, but is rather a general characteristic of the American system as a whole, and has been for many decades. This corruption can be attributed to two Supreme Court rulings in the USA. 1970 SIXS Buckley v. Valio ruling, which characterized money for policy outcome transactions as constitutionally protected freedom of speech. Then 2010's Citizens United ruling, which amplified the damage of Buckley v. Valio by allowing contributions of unlimited size to occur. There are entire groups such as Wolf Pack dedicated to getting money out of politics in the USA. Former President Jimmy Carter called the USA an oligarchy with unlimited political bribery. Presidential candidate Marianne Williamson launched her campaign to be the Democratic Party nominee by calling Washington now more than not a system of legalized bribery. This government is now more than not a system of legalized bribery. And this system will not change itself. It's the issue of all issues that continues to define both domestic and international policy making by the USA's government, regardless of which party is in power. But how does this connect to the situation in Gaza? Allow me to explain. In the USA, there is a lobbying group called a PAC, or the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee is a powerful political lobbying group that advocates pro-Israel policies to the legislative and executive branches of the United States. In a press conference, Senator Bernie Sanders summarizes money in politics and a PAC. If you get there, you will be able to spend unlimited amounts of money, hundreds of millions of dollars supporting candidates you like or defeating candidates you don't like. That is not a democracy. That is a corrupt political system. It is no secret, therefore, that in the midst of all of this, we have lobbying groups like APAC and the far-right Christians United for Israel lobby who are providing unquestioning support for Israel's right-wing government. They are spending enormous sums of money right now to influence our political system. Money, politics, foreign policy. Last election cycle, APAC Super PAC spent over $30 million in dark money to oppose progressive candidates, many of whom I have personally worked with and supported, who spoke out in favor of Palestinian human rights instantly. That's all you got to do speak out in favor of the dignity, that's all, of the Palestinian people, and then uh, you are on the APAC hit list, uh, and you will be the recipients of large amounts of money trying to defeat you. And we have to acknowledge that APAC was successful uh, in all but two of their races. The message was clear. If you criticize Netanyahu, you will be targeted Meanwhile, because they are a bipartisan group, APAC not only contributes heavily to Democrats, but endorses more than 100 election-denying right-wing pro-insurrectionist republics, Republicans. 
This election, APAC is expected to spend approximately $100 million just to try to unseat progressive members of Congress who dare to speak out about what's going on in Gaza. So anyone who wants to talk about foreign policy, or for that matter, anything else that goes on in Congress, without recognizing the corrupt political system that we have and the impact that money has over what we do really doesn't know very much about what's going on. On January 10th, The Guardian reported, Congress backers of Gaza war received most from pro-Israel donors. Congress members who were more supportive of Israel at the start of the Gaza war received over $100,000 more on average from pro-Israel donors during their last election than those who most supported Palestine, a Guardian analysis of campaign data shows. Those who took more money most often called for U.S. military support and backed Israel's response, even as Gaza's civilian death toll mounted, the findings show. The analysis, which looks at positions taken during the war's first six weeks, does not prove any particular member changed their position because they received pro-Israel campaign donations. However, some campaign finance experts who viewed the data argue that donor spending helped fuel Congress's overwhelming support for Israel. The analysis compared campaign contributions from pro-Israel groups and individuals to almost every member of the current Congress with each lawmaker's statements on the war through mid-November. About 82% of Congress members were more supportive of Israel, and just 9% more supportive of Palestine during this period. The remainder had mixed views. Legislators categorized as supportive of Israel received about $125,000 on average during their last election, while those supportive of Palestine on average took about $18,000. The volume and breadth of the donor spending is considerable, over $58 million went to current Congress members, and all but 33 received donations. On February 20, 2024, Common Dreams reported. After Gaza ceasefire veto, Biden to attend fundraiser at home of pro-Israel billionaire. The American Muslim community is running out of words to describe our feelings about the Biden administration's support for the Gaza genocide, said one advocate. Hours after his ambassador to the United Nations vetoed the third ceasefire resolution to be proposed at the UN Security Council since Israel began its US-backed bombardment of Gaza in October, President Joe Biden was scheduled to attend a high-dollar fundraiser at the home of an influential pro-Israel billionaire on Tuesday. Tickets for the event hosted in Los Angeles by media mogul Chaim Sabin started at $3,300 and cost as much as $250,000. Other exclusive fundraising events for Biden, who is seeking re-election in November, have been disrupted in recent months by protesters demanding that the U.S. end its support for Israel, which has killed more than 29,000 Palestinians in Gaza since October. The Jewish-led Palestinian rights group, if not now pointed out that Sabin has been quoted as suggesting the U.S. should scrutinize Muslims to get them to admit they are or they're not terrorists. If not now are quoted, this morning Biden vetoed a ceasefire in Gaza. Tonight he goes to a fundraiser hosted by a PAC billionaire Chaim Sabin, with donors giving up to $250,000 each. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also has connections to the political lobbying group APAC as he has been a speaker at their events in the past. In case you were wondering, APAC is against a ceasefire. Here on February 28, a PAC tweets their political position on the Gaza. These are their political positions. Congress should pass emergency aid to Israel. No ceasefire until the hostages are free and Hamas is gone. Israel is trying to avoid civilian casualties. Proceed with an operation in Rafah. Around two-thirds of USA voters, 67%, including majorities of Democrats, 77%, independents, 69%, and Republicans, 56%, support the U.S. calling for a permanent ceasefire and a de-escalation of violence in Gaza. This is however not reflected in government or Congress due to the corrosive influence of money in politics. The Israeli government is also very open about their activities influencing policy in the U.S. government. On February 12, 2020, Benjamin Netanyahu tweets, in recent years, we have promoted laws in most U.S. states, which determine that strong action is to be taken against whoever tries to boycott Israel. In this moment, ahead of the 2024 presidential elections in the USA, 
a PAC has a disproportionate amount of leverage over candidates on both sides of the aisle, including the Biden administration. The Biden administration has to rely on a PAC's election money and if Biden goes against Israel's agenda in this crisis, then he risks facing a PAC spending against him in the upcoming election. The corruption in Washington is leading to repeated ceasefire vetoes at the Security Council, with devastating consequences for the Palestinian people. This corrupt status quo must end, which is why I would also like to discuss the UNCAC Treaty, United Nations Convention Against Corruption. The UNCAC Treaty is the world's only binding anti-corruption instrument. Both Ireland and the USA are signatories to this treaty, however due to the USA's aforementioned Supreme Court rulings Buckley v. Valio and Citizens United, the USA's implementation of this anti-corruption treaty have been subpar leaving many loopholes for corruption to thrive within, the biggest loophole of all being that they can't actually ban political corruption directly because of their Supreme Court ruling. The purposes of this convention are a. To promote and strengthen measures to prevent and combat corruption more efficiently and effectively, b. To promote, facilitate and support international cooperation and technical assistance in the prevention of and fight against corruption, including in asset recovery, c. To promote integrity, accountability, and proper management of public affairs and public property. Some of the obligations under the treaty include. Each state party shall in accordance with the fundamental principles of its legal system, develop and implement or maintain effective, coordinated anti-corruption policies that promote the participation of society and reflect the principles of the rule of law, proper management of public affairs and public property, integrity, transparency, and accountability. Each state party shall endeavor to establish and promote effective practices aimed at the prevention of corruption. Each state party shall endeavor to periodically evaluate relevant legal instruments and administrative measures with a view to determining their adequacy to prevent and fight corruption. States parties shall, as appropriate and in accordance with the fundamental principles of their legal system, collaborate with each other and with relevant international and regional organizations in promoting and developing the measures referred to in this article. That collaboration may include participation in international programs and projects aimed at the prevention of corruption. The USA system of unlimited political bribery definitely fails to meet its obligations under the UNCAC treaty that each state party shall endeavor to establish and promote effective practices aimed at the prevention of corruption. There is a dispute mechanism present within the treaty. I believe a nation needs to file a dispute with the USA over their implementation of the UNCAC treaty. This would do a few things. It would put pressure on the U.S. government both publicly and internationally not to cape to special interest donors that want the war in Gaza to continue. It could also end the impunity that Israel receives from the USA consistently vetoing. It would enable the USA to use those mechanisms of leverage without Israel having leverage over the USA. If the USA can actually use its leverage by conditioning aid, it could prevent Benjamin Netanyahu from blocking a two-state solution. I've reached out to 327 politicians from the Republic of Ireland, Belgium, Norway, South Africa, and Brazil to propose this strategy. Some of the responses have shown interest and understanding of the situation, but it remains to be seen how things will play out. This video script was based off of this email I've been sending around. Article 66. Settlement of Disputes. L. States parties shall endeavor to settle disputes concerning the interpretation or application of this convention through negotiation. 2. Any dispute between two or more states parties concerning the interpretation or application of this convention that cannot be settled through negotiation within a reasonable time shall, at the request of one of those states parties, be submitted to arbitration. If, six months after the date of the request for arbitration, those states' parties are unable to agree on the organization of the arbitration. Any one of those states' parties may refer the dispute to the International Court of Justice by request in accordance with the statute of the court. 3. Each state party may, at the time of signature, ratification, acceptance or approval of or accession to this convention, declare that it does not consider itself bound by paragraph 2 of this article. The other state's party shall not be bound by paragraph 2 of this article with respect to any state party that has made such a reservation. 4. 
Any state party that has made a reservation in accordance with paragraph 3 of this article may at any time withdraw that reservation by notification to the Secretary General of the United Nations.